Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, submitting my humble pranams to uh, His Holiness Jagat Guru Sri Shivata Ishwara Deshi Kendra Mahaswami Ji. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Chivish Kumar, Faculty JSS College of Pharmacy, Mysore, a constant college of JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research. I hope uh, you all are safe and uh, healthy during this uh, 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 pandemic situation. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you all for this uh, webinar uh, on the title, Can Artificial Intelligence Revolutionize uh, Drug Discovery? Uh, organized by Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, uh, JSSCPM, <coughs> Mysore. Uh, firstly, I'm glad to welcome our principal, sir, Dr. P.M. Pramod Kumar, JSS College of Pharmacy, Mysore. I welcome you, sir. Uh, I extend my uh, present welcome to our proud alumnus and my batchmate and good friend, Dr. Suman Sirimulla, working as Assistant Professor of Medicinal Chemistry, School of Pharmacy, uh, the University of Texas at El Paso, US. And thank you, uh, Dr. Suman, for sincerely accepting our invitation as a research person. A uh, hearty, hearty welcome to you. My Thank warm you. welcome to uh, Dr. G. Pooja, sir, uh, head of the department, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, Mysore. Uh, welcome you, sir. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, I also welcome my uh, colleagues and panelists, Dr. B. Shanta Kumar and uh, Dr. Dorayanan Kumar. Uh, lastly, uh, a warm welcome to all the participants uh, who have registered and participated uh, for this webinar. I'm sure uh, this webinar will be uh, very informative and uh, helpful. Uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. P. M. Pramod Kumar, principal, to give uh, opening remarks uh, on this webinar. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yogesh. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. At the outset, I uh, uh, seek the blessings of His Holiness uh, Swamiji. And uh, we are here uh, for the webinar on uh, uh, AI and drug discovery. Certainly, the title would have been uh, much more... Uh, uh, precise. Can artificial intelligence revolutionize drug discovery? Certainly, yes, because it has already made a big boom and uh, you cannot question uh, because it is something like uh, in all walks of life, in all the phases of drug discovery or be it anything you think of, right from Alexa to Siri to anything, all these are uh, part of uh, AI initiative only. Certainly, the uh, answer to that uh, title is yes, it, has, uh, uh, it is revolutionizing the drug discovery. And if you look into the uh, present market, certainly there, there is a lot of market analysis, which was uh, predicting almost 259 US dollars in 2019. And by 2024, they say that it is almost 1,434 million US dollars only in drug discovery in AI. So that is a quantum of uh, money that is pumped in and uh, uh, maybe it may be even uh, many more also. By this, we have uh, the scientists would have gained a lot of uh, new uh, ideas, new insights, new workings, way of working. Um, the way how we work and all is going to uh, really make a big uh, change. And uh, there are a number of leading uh, players, which uh, our uh, uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Suman, would uh, uh, walk us through all those. And uh, there cannot be other person uh, uh, other than Dr. Suman who has been practicing it in day-to-day uh, -day in his union uh, uh, in the School of Pharmacy where he's working. And there are a number of uh, big players here, like uh, we have uh, IBM, Microsoft, Google, and uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA, most of uh, the present generation would be aware of uh, all these uh, video games and all those things. So all these different players are uh, making a big initiative in the AI. And uh, I'm not uh, the technical person here. Uh, you would be hearing of number of definition like uh, supervised, unsupervised uh, 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 learning and about the ML, deep learning, what are these things? And uh, in all the different uh, phases, if you look in AI and drug discovery, right from designing to the polypharmacy, pharmacology, everywhere it is being, uh, being made. In the drug design, predicting the 3D structure, it is already there. It is uh, doing a wonderful job. And uh, even predicting the protein, uh, drug protein interactions also, it is making a uh, big, and it is making the life of the scientist uh, very simple. Here, AI can be of uh, either uh, uh, developing a software or providing the services. 
using the software how do we uh, cater to the industry requirement even uh, designing the bio specific and multi target drug molecules also is one of the thing even in chemical synthesis the current uh, covid pandemic has taught us uh, to go for uh, drug repurposing even in the drug repurposing uh, area also this has uh, really done a good job identify identification of the therapeutic target and prediction of the new therapeutic area as well and uh, even drug screening activity also it has uh, gained lot of momentum so i will not take uh, much of your time uh, we would like to hear more from uh, dr suman and uh, uh, say enrich arsels even at the jss uh, uh, academy of higher education research a small initiative has been made forming a special interest group where the radiology and um, uh, medical doctors pharmacists dentists all are working on that platform uh, to see how we can integrate uh, or impregnate the knowledge of ai into all different walks of uh, the medical sciences uh thank you very much and um, uh, it is very nice that department of pharmaceutical chemistry under the leadership of uh, dr pujar and his team has taken up this initiative i thank uh, uh, uh yogesh uh, for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this inauguration thank you over to you uh thank you sir thank you for the valuable opening remarks uh now i request uh, dr gv pujar sir to introduce the uh, today's speaker Uh, thank you yogesh for the opportunity very good morning to all at the outset my humble pranams to his holiness swami ji of uh, sutur mat it is my pleasure and happy to introduce our proud alumnus dr suman sirmula candidate to all dr suman presently working as assistant professor of pharmaceutical sciences founding faculty of school of pharmacy and director of computer aided drug discovery lab at university of Texas El Poso USA earlier to the present position he worked as a student professor at uh, St Louis College of Pharmacy for 2 years and later uh, earlier to that lecture at North Northern Arizona University for 4 years he has over 15 years of experience in developing and utilizing cutting edge artificial intelligence tools for drug discovery projects Dr. Suman work a highly interdisciplinary and his research interest ranging from understanding non-covalent interactions between protein ligand complexes drug discovery and personalized medicine to high performance computing and artificial intelligence Dr. Suman and his co- collaborators are currently working on several drug uh, discovery projects to develop inhibitors for the treatment of multiple diseases He was awarded a grant of uh, eighty thousand dollars from the National Science Foundation (NSF) to develop antiviral drugs targeting COVID-19. He is currently working on fa- finding drug candidates for the treatment of COVID-19, and he has developed a predictive models using machine learning approaches. He recently disclosed anti-SARS CoV-2 cytopathic effect (CPE). and cytoxidy data by national center for advancing Na- translational science that is mcats nih and the same data was published recently in uh, nature mission intelligence journal he has illustrated the mechanism of action of drugs identified in large scale screening towards sars cov2 cytopathic effect by mapping the connection of drugs to host genes to viral proteins and developed a machine learning model to predict a drug synergy towards anti sars cov2 effect dr suman is well versed with the computational tools and including artificial intelligence we have seen uh, several uh, papers on uh, on using it, artificial intelligence uh, and uh, that brings uh, you know a lot of uh, expertise in working with uh, uh ai in towards a drug discovery with this wide exposure uh, to drug discovery research and computational tools i am sure dr suman will enrich us today with his talk on artificial intelligence can transform drug discovery process 
i hope uh, 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 this brief introduction uh, would help uh, audit, uh, the participants uh, about the, the enrich uh, the uh, about uh, the uh, research experience of dr suman and i over to uh, yogesh uh, for uh, 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 thank you sir thank you uh, very much uh, for introducing our today's speaker uh, now i request uh, dr suman uh, uh, to start the session by uh, sharing the slides uh, meanwhile i request all the participants to ask uh, questions if any in q and a box uh, so we'll take up uh, after the completion of the session please suman uh, you can share the screen yeah Okay, so I guess uh, you're seeing my uh, screen. Yes, uh, yes, Suman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Um, so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the school, uh, Swamiji, and um, all my um, uh, lecturers uh, who uh, imparted education in me, and uh, the the panelists first, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Pramod Kumar sir, who has given a very nice uh, introduction of artificial intelligence uh, towards drug discovery. So actually he gave like the gist of my talk, uh, basically. Um, so, um, and, and um, uh, Dr. Pujar uh, for, uh, uh, Pujar sir for a very nice introduction and uh, my dear friend Yogi here uh, and uh, other panelists. So, um, so with that, I'll uh, start my presentation. Um, so first, um, what we um, are looking here is um, artificial intelligence. When we say artificial intelligence, like, okay, when I was doing my bachelor's in pharmacy, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence. And uh, so most of the, um, most of our education was towards pharmacy, um, but now like, okay, I became uh, an, an expert in utilizing artificial intelligence tools. Um, so I see like okay, some of you might be, I'm expecting most of uh, the students here are bachelors in pharmacy. And uh, you may be thinking maybe this is outside the field, but it's, it's actually not. So it's like the artificial intelligence, there are applicants are everywhere. Um, and uh, so here today we are looking at in, in, in terms of drug discovery, how um, these AI tools can be used for drug discovery and can be applied um, towards drug discovery. So again, if you look at artificial intelligence um, um, and machine learning, where can we use these in, in drug discovery process? So if you look at drug discovery process, we know this is a very, very expensive process. Uh, in the US, like it is estimated, it will take about three, um, 3 billion US dollars. So that's a lot of money and it would take about uh, 10 years to 20 years. Uh, depending upon the project. So that's a long uh, process and there is a lot of money involved. Um, so here, if we can predict and if we can um, design molecules that are safe, that are active um, and that, are, that can be successful uh, in, in the discovery process, we can save a lot of money and a lot of time. So that's why this is critical and it can revolutionize the drug discovery. So where it can be applied. Uh, so if you look at the drug discovery process, it's, it's a huge process. So first, like usually in a drug discovery process, we usually um, target um, um, some of the proteins. So in identifying some of the proteins, like, okay, for the particular disease, uh, we, there is a lot of omics data. So we can use this lot of omics data and then we can prioritize in prioritizing targets based on the data. So that's one of the uh, early on process that we can apply for this uh, artificial intelligence. And then once we know the target, like, okay, the next uh, uh, phase is like, you are trying to find a lead molecule and you're also trying to find the molecules that can interact with it and have an activity and also this drug discovery is a multi-parameter optimization problem where like okay, it's not just it have an effect towards that particular um, protein, but you also were looking for different parameters so such as like uh, solubility, drug metabolism, pharmacokinetic properties. So in optimizing those properties, in predicting the properties of the molecules. So 
so those are uh, predicting the properties and also in generating the molecules that can have optimized properties. So those are some of the things that we, where AI can be used. And today I'm gonna to show some of the examples and like some of the algorithms, how that is, is it can be done. And then not just like in the uh, lead optimization or lead generation process, but also in the clinical trials, this is again, like a very, um, uh, a huge part of um, huge part of drug discovery uh, with clinical trials. So if you can predict the outcome of the clinical trials, that will have a huge impact because um, uh, two thirds of the money in drug discovery process um, will go into the clinical trials. And uh, so if you can predict some of these outcomes early on, that the, the molecules that are generated, if they can be successful in the clinical trial, then that will have a huge impact in the drug discovery process. So. It can be applied. So if you look at um, 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 the machine learning and artificial intelligence, this can be applied in, in several places in the drug discovery process and the time and the money can be uh, reduced. So what is this um, artificial intelligence or machine learning or, or, or deep learning? Um, so if you look at this artificial intelligence, um, artificial intelligence is a, is a, is a bigger term uh, in which you have uh, machine learning is a part of it and deep learning is part of the machine learning. So if you say artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence? It is a, a program that can sense, reason, act and adapt. So this is something that we also do. So we have a natural intelligence as, as a people, uh, as, a, as a human beings and as, as, a, as, a, as a living um, beings, so we, we, we have a natural intelligence. Um, so here we're talking about artificial intelligence where the computer are, are a program um, that can do something that, that we do it uh, as well. Um, so, um, so artificial intelligence basically it is a program that can sense, reason, act and adapt. And uh, we have machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. So here, when we're talking about a machine learning, so we're talking about algorithms um, whose performance improve as they're exposed to more data over time. So you're, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're correlating, you have a data and you're trying to correlate that to some property. Uh, and that is something that can be improved again based on the, if you have any more uh, data. And then we have a deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. Um, so this deep learning, what it is, is it's a machine learning, but it has a multi-layer neural networks, uh, which actually uh, can learn more from the data. So if you have more uh, increased uh, uh, increase data, it can have a better results. So if you see deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, so if you look at the timeline, so this artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, um, so these are not new. These have been there for a very long time. So if you look at like, okay, so the artificial intelligence algorithms have been there since 1950s. So that's, a, um, that's more than like uh, uh, six or say, it's about like seven decades old. So we, th there, is an, uh, uh, th there is an algorithmic developments back then. Um, and then there was an early uh, excitement there, uh, but then um, it, it wasn't uh, very well applied because of two reasons. One is like, okay, back then, like we don't have sophisticated computers, uh, but now we have more sophisticated computers um, and also the data. So AI can get better and better with the data. So back then we, we, they don't have uh, much data, but um, as the time progressed, we, now we have more and more data and we have more computing power. So because of that, now like, okay, this machine learning and deep learning, now these, because deep learning, as I mentioned, like, okay, this can, this is data hungry and based on the, uh, as, as you have increased data, you can have improved accuracies. So now we have more data, more computing power, so, uh, and we have uh, better algorithms. So now, because that's why we have a boom uh, right now uh, where these can be applied and we can have a, um, we are having a game-changing results. So um, if you look at um, machine learning, what is machine learning? Uh, within machine learning, there are, there are two types. One is unsupervised learning and there is a supervised learning. So unsupervised learning is something like you have a data, but you don't know what the data means. So you cluster it. So basically you, 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 you lay out the data, you do the clustering, and then you figure out like, okay, the things that are associated close together and you're trying to find out what is the meaning, why these things are close together. Okay, so do you have a relation between those two? 
So for example, like, okay, if you have a, uh, if, when you cluster, if you're looking at the genes and if you cluster some genes and in the, in the cancer uh, patients, okay, and you have like, okay, bunch of uh, genes closer together, uh, probably those are the ones that are bad genes, like that are, those are close together. So they have a relation or like good genes are closer together and they have a relation. So those, um, so you have unsupervised learning where you do clustering and you try to make sense of the data. Um, then th that is unsupervised learning. And then you have a supervised learning. In supervised learning, uh, so here you're asking a, a question and like you're trying to predict something. So in this case, you're, you're predicting uh, something and there in supervised learning, uh, typically you have uh, two types of uh, problems. One is classification and the other one is a regression. So when you say classification, so classification, the name itself has it. So you're classifying things. For example, you have molecules uh, here right now we have uh, we were in the midst of um, of a pandemic and we're looking for drugs for the COVID. So we're looking for can this drug molecule can be repurposed? Um, can this molecule will work for the COVID or not? So those kind of things like if you're trying to classify. So or like if you have a cancer um, a protein uh, and like you're trying to find a drug molecule for that uh, cancer target. So you're you're looking at whether the molecule will be active or not active. Uh, or if you're looking in terms of, um, for example, if you're looking at the metabolic properties, um, see if the molecule will be uh, metabolized by certain enzyme or not. So you're saying like yes or no. Uh, uh, you're figuring out whether it's a yes or no. So problems. So, so that's a classification. And then we have regression problems. So regression, when we say regression, here we are, this is a, a, uh, this is a continuous. Um, so that means like you're trying to find a number in this case, you're trying to find the property, which is actually a number. Um, so uh, you, for example, like binding affinities, if you have a drug molecule, how much will, what will be its IC50 value or EC50 value? So those are the ones that are regression problems. So you're trying to find whether it will be a, uh, whether it will have a 10 micromolar concentration range or 10 nanomolar concentration range, whatever uh, the IC50 or EC50 value. So that's a regression and classification. So if you look at here, here is an example, like, okay, when we lay the data here, there you have two genes, one is a disease genes and you have healthy genes. So here you're classifying so you're putting this data here and like, okay, here is, um, by using the algorithm, you're drawing this line to classify these two, uh, this data. So here, what you have is all the disease genes and here you have like healthy genes. So this is a classification problem. You're trying to uh, figure out whether the gene is a disease gene or a healthy gene. And uh, here, uh, if you look at the regression problem here, you're looking at, um, uh, here is an example, like, okay, if you have this gene, like, okay, these people have survived or these people survived for how many years? Um, so here you're looking at the number, how many years these people have survived with that particular, with, with this particular gene. So you're correlating this gene to, um, to, to, the, to, the, to the number of years that they have survived. So this is a regression problem. Here is an example. And here, when we're talking about machine learning, so usually you have a linear correlation. In this case, what you see is a linear correlation. Um, um, so here is a linear correlation, but like when we are using advanced machine learning algorithms, when we are using advanced machine learning algorithm, we're going non-linear. So in this case, like, okay, the data to classify here is like, okay, you cannot just draw a line or, or this. So you're, you're going like, okay, all the way, uh, uh, more of like a circle in this case. So this is, these are non-linear methods. So you're using mathematical representation to, to correlate your data and you're, tra you're drawing this line and uh, you're saying like everything that falls inside is, uh, is yes and everything that falls outside is no. So that's, uh, th this is um, uh, machine learning. So he, uh, in a simple terms, uh, this is what machine learning. So what you're trying to do is you have a data uh, and you laid out and uh, you're trying to uh, come up with this equation, like, okay, in which area, if it falls in certain area, then you're predicting that molecule is, is, is such. And if you're, it is away, then the molecule is, is the other way. So um, if you look at the machine learning model development process, so usually machine, for machine learning model development, you have a training data, whatever you have uh, data, you usually split into two things. One, you have a training data because first you need to learn the process. Um, and then you, what you do is you, you predict. So you split your data into training and, and, and a prediction day and, 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 uh, and a predicting data uh, are usually called as a test set. 
So, um, so you, you uh, so you, you you split your data into into three different types. You have a raw data, so you have a training set, uh, and you have a validation set, and you have a test set. You have three different sets in this case. Um, so what you do is you take your data, and usually you you extract the features from the data. So here we are talking in terms of um, drug molecules or chemical molecules. So like uh, you have a molecule that have some kind of properties and chemical features. So sometimes we take physical properties, but there are also uh, properties that come straight from the structure. So we take the features. Um, so this is important. So you can use different kinds of features um, and that will have an impact on your, uh, on your model as well. So you have a feature and then you split into training, validation and test set and you use the training set to develop a model. Uh, and then you test initially with your validation set. And once you know like, okay, it is working, then what you do is you have a, an external test set which you actually test again on that model and see if it's good, you take that model. And then what you do is you test with your new data. Um, and now you have a model to predict whatever you wanna do. And uh, so this is what we, we develop. And then this is what we use for testing for the next set of, um, 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 and, uh, for the next set of data. So like before we do experiments, we, we test um, those data with the developed model and see if it works, then we go for the, um, for the testing. So here, um, so we're talking about machine learning. Uh, I give um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, but like, okay, here, this term, um, all the pharmacy students should be, um, um, uh, uh, should know about this is, is a structured activity relationships. So as most of you are taking uh, chemistry and medicine chemistry classes, you all know structure activity relationships. So you see, um, you make a small change in the molecule and you see there is an, a change in the activity. So we, we study these structure active relationships in, in medicine chemistry class. Okay, but in this case, when we say QSAR, which is a quantitative structure activity uh, relationships. So we are quantifying how much will it change? So for example, okay, here you put a chlorine. Okay, you will see that there is a different activity here. You put a methyl group or something like that, that, that will change an activity. And, and we, we know uh, this is what usually medicine chemists do. They synthesize, if, if, you, if you have a molecule that has some activity, they synthesize a bunch of molecules similar to this. So they synthesize congeners, congeners meaning like, okay, the molecules that are very similar to this with the small change, uh, small modifications, keeping the same basic structure. And then you, you, you again, do the experiments to to check the activity. So before, like, so, so for, for um, so synthesizing molecules, it takes a lot of time and energy and effort. Um, so if you have a data, so once you have some of the data, what you can do is you can take the molecular features uh, from the structures. And um, so here, for example, like, okay, here, this has a different feature. So the molecular features, you take the molecular descriptors and you have the, uh, activity for certain molecules. So when you have the data, if you have a bunch of molecules with their uh, properties, and if you know their activity, so you can correlate their uh, molecular descriptors to the to the activity. So usually you you correlate using uh, the statistical analysis. So what you do is you you correlate them and you generate this uh, equation, mathematical equation. Uh, we call this uh, usually a simple equation we use is multilinear reg regression, but if you use artificial, uh, if you use machine learning methods, we can go nonlinear to fit the data uh, to get the better correlations. So, and so you have a validation of a QSAR. So once you have a valid method, you can use that before you synthesize the molecules, you can use that particular equation uh, that you developed and um, um, assess its activity before you even um, even synthesize the molecules, and so that way, like you reduce the time and um, effort um, in this case. So um, here again, like a, a use case, like okay, here um, um, artificial intelligence um, and machine learning can these um, expedite uh, drug discovery? So here is a. Uh, here is a uh, Nature Biotechnology paper that was published like, uh, uh, now it's almost uh, two years ago, but um, um, so here, 
but using deep learning, like, okay, so here for the target was uh, taken and they designed molecules within 21 days and within 46 days, they, they, they synthesized and uh, they performed in vitro synthesis and identified some compounds that can uh, actually have a good properties. Um, so this was in record time, like in 46 days, like you can come up with a molecule, design, synthesize, and do the experiments. So can we, can that be done? So like, okay, here, uh, so this paper shows like uh, this can be done uh, pretty quickly. So AI, uh, it's not just the drug discovery, uh, not just in the molecule development, but also it has been um, uh, um, showing, um, uh, it has been applied in several other fields here. For example, uh, protein structure prediction. This is also very, very important. Um, uh, element in drug discovery because um, uh, if you want to design drugs, you need to know what um, what target uh, you are targeting, what protein you are targeting, and you need to know the structure of the protein. So if you know the structure of the protein, you can design the molecule that can uh, rightly fit in. So the structure of the protein is very important. So this protein folding problem, it's been there for a very, very long time. This has been an unsolved problem, but here um, there are a lot of people who are working on it, but uh, recently uh, AlphaFold, uh, which is a subsidiary of Google, these guys um, come up with um, uh, this algorithm, which has actually performed very well. So there is a, this blind challenges, which is a CASP critical assessment of structure of protein. So this CASP, uh, this blind challenges in this blind challenges, um, um, these guys um, did very well and compared to other people. So the AI method has, has really outperformed other uh, other methods. Um, so this this was in um, 2018 alpha full, they did uh, very well uh, compared to the others. Uh, but in alpha two, which was like uh, very recently in 2020, uh, they did very, very well. It was like right well within the experimental um, uh, right well within the experimental error. So usually like, um, so if you get up to 90, that's where like you called as this GDT, uh, this is a global distance um, a metric that they're using. Um, so here, th this one is, is pretty close. Um, if, if it's above 90, that is considered as a within the experimental error and they were able to predict within the experimental error. So that's great. So like, so here, like you can see an example where it's really, really revolutionizing and it's also part of drug discovery, protein structure prediction is very important. And here I'm gonna talk about another uh, um, uh, application, uh, automating chemical synthesis using artificial intelligence. So here, um, the, here, this is an uh, IBM Robo reaction for chemistry, where they're trying. What they're trying to do is they're trying to automate the chemical synthesis uh, process because chemical synthesis is is very very important uh, for uh, drug discovery and also for material discovery. So there are vast applications for chemical synthesis. So here in the context of drug discovery, again, like uh, the biggest bottleneck is chemical synthesis. Um, and I can, and here um, we are making a lot of um, progress in the, in automating this chemical synthesis. So here, uh, there, there are twofold um, effort here. One, um, what we are doing um, with the AI is predicting the, uh, pre predicting the, uh, retrosynthetic uh, pathways. So you have a molecule, you, first you designed a molecule, for example, uh, you design a molecule and you know that has an optimal properties, but can you synthesize it? So here by using artificial intelligence, okay, we, we are predicting the retrosynthetic pathway. So like, okay, from, by using uh, from the precursors, how we can synthesize, the, synthesize these molecules. And not only just predicting the retrosynthetic pathways, but also we are automating the uh, uh, automating the synthetic uh, process where like okay the where the trivial task and the, and other tasks are are automating. So here in this uh, picture you can see like this here is a robot doing the uh, doing the synthesis. So how does this work? Like okay, so if you look at this um, the way the, the way this works here uh, when we are developing this AI algorithms, what we are uh, looking at is. We're, we're, we're assuming um, atoms uh, as letters, we're assuming. So what we're using is uh, we're using natural language processing, uh, which is machine learning um, uh, approaches that have been developed for other applications, for example, for the language, um, 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 uh, for, uh, for the language that we're, that's where we are, we are using here into, in, into chemistry. So we are using atoms 
uh, as letters and we are using uh, molecules as words uh, and reactions as sentences. So atoms as words, uh, molecules as uh, words, uh, atoms as letters, molecules as words and um, reactions as sentences. And we are using the algorithm that I've been doing uh, by using natural language processing to uh, to learn the language, okay, we are applying that, those here. So as you know, like, okay, you see like most of this uh, Google uh, and um, Facebook, they've been developing a lot of novel algorithms. So we are bringing those here and applying here um, uh, for, uh, for drug discovery. So, so most of this AI, uh, Google, Facebook, they, they're, they're predicting, they're developing a lot of algorithms to send junk to you guys. Um, a lot of advertisements and everything. So we're using those, um, some of those algorithms and uh, developing um, uh, AI uh, tools for uh, drug discovery. So here is another example where nowadays they were training uh, molecules uh, with the pictures that they're taking from the uh, experiments. So here you can see the cells. Um, so here, um, uh, you can see drugs that are causing holes. And here you can see drugs that are, uh, um, uh, uh, the cells uh, that are have a uh, multiple nuclei. Uh, so these are, so when you're treating drugs, okay, some cells are doing this and some cells are doing this. So you're classifying this. If you have a new drug, uh, you test new drug before you test it, you know, will this go this way or this way? So you're trying to uh, classify using, um, uh, using machine learning. So AI applications, um, so I show some machine learning. So let's look at some AI applications. So here, uh, when we talk about drug design, um, so this is a multi-parameter optimization task. Um, what does that mean? Uh, so that means like, okay, if you have a drug molecule, it's not just the drug molecule is active uh, for a given target. Uh, it's not you, you just uh, check on a Petri dish or like in a, in a, in a, in a tube. Um, that it has an activity or within a cell, you, you, it's not over. Um, so, because like we need the molecules to be safe in humans, okay, it has to reach the particular target. It needs to have, so to do that, it, ha it needs to have a certain solubility. It needs to, it shouldn't have any uh, drug drug interactions. So, like you're looking for um, uh, their activity towards. Um, transporters and also uh, different um, uh, metabolic enzymes. So, so there are several things that you, you, you need to look into it. Uh, it's not just selectivity. So, so the, the, the drug design is a multi-parameter uh, optimization task. And that's why this is really, really challenging because there are, there are so many things that can happen within the body. So uh, can we, so we need to account for everything so, so that's a, um, so that is the task. So here, um, so what we can do with AI. So here, if you look at, a, I just want to show you guys this inverse problem. So here, usually, if you have a target, um, so you want to have certain uh, certain IC50 value and certain metabolic properties and certain toxicity. Uh, if you do an experiment, you, there are so many chemical molecules, like it is potentially it's estimated up to 10 to the 60 uh, drug-like compounds. That's too many compounds. You can't test all of them. Um, so, I mean, if you test some of them, you may hit somewhere, but that's not what you want. You, this is your, your target. That's a bullseye. That means like a molecule with all the desired properties. So you, you wanted to reach there, okay? Um, so if you do some of the experiments such as like um, watcher screening, docking, okay, you may find some molecules uh, that may come closer. Um, but uh, with AI, what you can do is, you can, if you use this as an optimization problem, you have a molecule, it's somewhere here, but this is where you need to reach. You can optimize it so that you can actually get uh, the molecule with all the, uh, all the desired properties. So that is the goal and that is the challenge here. Uh, what we're uh, trying to use, solve is like using artificial intelligence with them. Um, yeah, uh, using artificial intelligence uh, algorithms to design molecules that can have all the optimal properties. So here, uh, there are different algorithms. Uh, I just want to give a little introduction. I know like um, uh, most of you are uh, not most of you. Uh, I would assume like uh, most of you uh, are not, um, have, have, have um, no background in artificial intelligence or machine learning. So uh, here is a, this is how we are designing um, 
I just want to give a little uh, introduction to the algorithms of this work. So what we are um, trying to do is we are, uh, we are trying to develop molecules uh, that have optimal properties. So for example, if you're looking for COVID, so it has to, uh, it has to be active against SARS-CoV-2, but it also needs to have, uh, uh, if you take, I mean, the, it's always desired to uh, give it as a pill. So like it, it needs to be soluble and it shouldn't be toxic and uh, it shouldn't have, um, um, it should have uh, desired metabolic properties and so on. So, in, in designing molecules, so the way we are doing this is again, like we're uh, here is an example. This is a uh, um, de novo design algorithm. Again, this uses natural language processing um, uh, method. So, first, I just want to give you guys like what uh, smiles are. So, if you look at smiles, you may be thinking that of laughing or smiling. So, that's not the smiles here. Uh, the smiles is another, it's a one dimensional representation. It's a one dimensional representation of a molecule. So you, you all know what a molecular formula um, is. So for example, if you have this molecule, um, so you can, you can write a molecular formula. Um, so it has um, uh, uh, five, six, uh, six carbon, C, so C5 or, or C6, O7, whatever you're writing a molecular formula, but molecular formula doesn't have the information of the molecule, how it is connected. So we use the SMILES um, in, in, in chem informatics uh, and machine learning. Um, so we use this format SMILES. So there, are, it's not only uh, SMILES, uh, it's a simplified molecular um, line entry system. Uh, the, that, that's what SMILES stands for. So there are different types of smiles. Here you have a generic smiles. So here, if you look at this, this has like, um, it, it's, you can see this is pretty similar to um, molecular formula, but they are all laid out. So instead of C6, but here like, okay, how oxygen is connected to the carbon, that, that is connected to the carbon and so on. So the connectivity information is there. Uh, here you have isomeric smiles, which has uh, uh, um, the, um, uh, which has um, um, uh, isomerism information, whether it's R or S and so on. And there is there are also other inform, uh, other um, uh, there are also other uh, type of um, representation in cheese. So here, so we're using like the smile representation. So we are taking the data. For example, I'm just going to show you um, uh, a simple example. So if I take if I randomly type something, three letters, DFJ, that doesn't mean anything. I'm gonna type one more time. Uh, um, so now this doesn't mean anything. Um, so I'm gonna type one more thing. Okay, so this, this has a meaning. So first I typed something randomly, second I typed uh, something randomly, and third I'm typing something randomly. So this is, so the third one has a meaning. So we are training the computer, uh, the, the algorithm, the way it works first is it generates the smiles using something like this. So we, we, we tell the computer randomly generate, um, generate smiles. And here, when it generates something, we are telling the computer here in this case, you have a day, that means this is a, uh, this is a word, day is a word. These are not words, not a meaningful word. So now it learned day is a word. Now again, then it will generate again a few things. Um, for example, it says, um, uh, so this doesn't have anything, any meaning, but S-A-Y, say, that is, a, that is a word. Now you're telling computer, uh, the way the algorithm was, this is not a word. Now you're telling this is not a word. Uh, day is a word. This is not a word, not a meaningful word. And then you have a say, which is a meaningful word. So you're, 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 you're telling the computer, you're making the computer learn language in this case by randomly generating something and telling it whether it's, it is something meaningful or not. Or, or not. So this, these, these are natural language processing um, algorithms. Um, so we're using that here and we're, we're telling computer to generate molecules. So the computer is generating molecules 
so here, this is an algorithm. So I'm just trying to show you like how it works and giving you a little information on how this is happening. Um, so first we are telling um, the computer to generate smiles, which is molecules, and we are letting it um, go to the next process. It's uh, here, the agent will tell whether it's an actual, it is an acceptable molecule or not acceptable molecule or not. And once it is unacceptable, then we are checking whether it will have a desired property or not. And if it has a desired property, it will go through the process. If not, it will go back and it will come, new molecule will come in and we'll check uh, with that. So here we're checking. So first step, we generate molecules and second step, we are generating different, uh, we are checking whether it has an active uh, activity towards a certain uh, property or not. So this is how we are using. So like we're, we're, we're using something that is used in natural language processing and we are applying that to, to chemistry here. Um, so we are, we are making the machines learn to generate molecules and to generate molecules that have specific properties. So here is an, another algorithm that I just wanted to show like, okay, this is uh, uh, you're using like um, uh, an, an algorithm that is used for face generation. So like, okay, here, here is a, um, a, a, a photograph of a woman. And um, so you take, if you look at this, uh, so this um, lady has a certain properties, for example, like uh, if you look at, she has a, she's a female. Uh, she has a, a uh, she doesn't have a black hair. She has a brown hair. She has a ma Cup, she doesn't have sunglasses. So there are a bunch of features um, that she has. So you're encoding that. So you're, you're taking this, the way this works is like you're, 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 you're encoding all that information. And from this, you're generating another, so this is called latent space. So you're taking information of a photograph in this case, uh, and you're converting that into a vector and you're encoding it. Mm -hmm. And then you were, by using this information, you're generating again back this, um, uh, this woman. So be based on the features. So here, uh, you, the idea here is like they, they wanted to get the same person, okay? But they can also change the person. So here you have a, she has a, she doesn't have, she have a brown hair, she doesn't have a black hair. What you're doing is you're flipping it. So now she has a black hair and a brown uh, and not a brown hair. So now you have the same person, but you change a little bit and you got a new person. She looks, um, and she has a new features. So this is what we are using again, in terms of molecules. So here you have a molecule, you're trying to generate the same molecule um, by taking the information, but here you're encoding them. Um, and you, now once you have in the latent space here, we change the person like here you see uh, brown hair to black hair. Uh, so here you're changing the properties a little bit. Uh, in this case, here is the molecule. You're trying to change the molecules a little bit in the, its latent space. So you're trying to uh, design molecules in such a way that uh, you're designing a molecule with optimal properties. So the properties that we are looking for. Uh, let me see how we're doing on the time. Um, okay. So, um, so, so I, I try to explain a little bit um, about the, the different types of algorithms that have been applied. Now, I just wanted to show some of the uh, uh, different things that we've been doing um, that have been applied and like, okay, widely used now. So here we have a project called LiganNet. So we're, what we did was uh, we developed uh, molecules, uh, we, we developed the machine learning models uh, for, different, um, um, uh, for, for different proteins and um, so here, um, so we use this database called Pharos for this one. So this has different types of proteins, human proteins. So there are like uh, several GPCRs um, and kinases, enzymes and so on. So there are about 1600 proteins that we have in the database um, that have a ligand activity. That means like there are some compounds that are associated with these proteins. And uh, for that, uh, we have uh, about 20, uh, at least, um, um, the proteins with at least 20 uh, compounds, uh, there are 834 of them. And so we developed models for these um, 834 um, uh, proteins. And um, so here, what we were looking at is if the molecule for a given molecule, so we develop a web portal. So on this um, website, if you go there, you can, you can submit a molecule uh, here and uh, actually it will give whether if it have an activity to any of the proteins in, in our list. So about 800 proteins, if the given drug molecule can hit to any of those proteins. 
So those are 800 uh, machine learning models that we have developed so, um, um, for, for this project. So if, um, if, any, if, if any of you, if you synthesize a molecule, if you wanted to know whether the molecule will have an activity towards any of the human proteins, uh, this uh, web portal can be used um, to look for the molecules that, um, uh, to look for the targets that it can hit. And uh, another project we had uh, we, do, we, we had was open DMPK. This is um, uh, to predict the drug metabolism and pharmacokinetic properties. Um, so here, um, so the, the workflow we had was like, okay, we're looking for the molecules uh, to predict the different uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetic properties. And if we're in terms of drug metabolism, what we are looking at is if the molecule is active towards certain uh, enzyme or not, metabolic enzyme or not. If it's a substrate, Okay, if the molecule is a substrate, um, so then we're looking whether that will lead to any drug-drug interactions. Um, and also we are predicting the site of metabolism. If, if it is a substrate to, for example, the CYP3A4 or something like that, so at what site it will be metabolized. So because we wanted to predict the metabolite and we wanted to predict if the metabolite is leading to a toxicity. So these are important because if the molecule itself is not, um, may not be a, um, toxic by itself, but when it um, uh, it is metabolized, uh, then the metabolic uh, product may be uh, may be toxic. So we are predicting, we are applying machine learning in, in different levels here. So this uh, project where we had all these uh, machine learning models developed for this. So here is an example. Um, so here is a molecule. This is uh, uh, metabolized uh, um, by FMO. Uh, flavin containing monooxygenases. So this flavin containing monooxygenases, they work on the nitrogens. Um, so a bunch of nitrogens. So here we're trying to predict like on which nitrogen it, this, uh, this uh, particular, um, um, uh, the, the enzyme will be, uh, will, um, will be metabolized. So which location, and based on that, we can predict uh, the product. And then we are looking again, if it's leading to any toxic product. So again, we, we, we actually develop a web portal for all these and uh, we have, uh, uh, we'll make it available for people. So these are all these web portals that have been developed for this. And uh, then we also have a deep learning application for docking as well. So docking, uh, if some of you know, like what docking is, we it's a, a cheap calculation where we can quickly do whether the molecule will fit the protein or not. And if it fits the protein, uh, basically what will be the affinity um, for the given molecule. So the theory here is if the drug molecule fits the protein uh, you, and uh, if it forms a, a stable complex, usually the energy is released. So we call this as a free energy and we're trying to estimate the free energy um, using the stocking programs. So these usually have a two parts. Uh, one is search algorithm and, uh, um, and a scoring function. Um, so search algorithm, uh, basically, if you have a, um, uh, when you have a protein, so on this protein, you, if you look at the molecule um, here, we are trying to search where, uh, how this molecule can be laid on this protein. So this is a search algorithm. And then you have a scoring function where you're trying to estimate the affinity at, at the each at each position. Um, so uh, there are again, uh, different methods here um, uh, for this. Um, so there are physics based, then there are machine learning based uh, scoring functions. And um, so one of my earlier work, uh, um, uh, which has um, a lot of impact in the field uh, was uh, docking method development. And we used, uh, we applied one of the um, uh, physics-based method where we corrected a method. Uh, so here, most of you, uh, all of your pharmacy students, you can see something here like, okay, here X, um, if this X is a chlorine, for example, if this X is a chlorine in this case, chlorine and oxygen, so this chlorine and oxygen, if you see, usually they repel because um, you, you would assume that, that they, they will repel. Uh, but if you have a chlorine um, and uh, this bond, so in this case, this is a CX um, on, on this, if this is on, on the halogen, usually you have a, a positive charge on the other side, on the distal side, that actually leads to an attractive force rather than a repulsive force. So if this is a chlorine, usually you think chlorine is a partial negative and oxygen is partial negative and uh, you have same charges, so they repel. Um, but here, if you look at the data, if the hydrogen versus chlorine, it, this is 
instead of 0.29 micromolars, this is 0 0.022 micromolars. That means the activity is increased. So the IC50 is doing much better. Um, it is doing much better uh, with the chlorine. So instead of repelling, it's attractive force. What is happening here is actually on this um, chlorine, you have a positive charge on the other side. Um, the whole molecule is not, um, the, the whole atom is not uh, partial negative, but there's a partial positive on the other side. And this is a, usually on the 180 degrees on the other side. So if the angle is correct, then usually you see an attractive force. So this is called as a halogen bond. I'm sure like you all heard uh, the term um, uh, hydrogen bond, but there is also something called halogen bond and this is an halogen bond. So we implemented this into a famous um, docking program. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the scoring function, but so here we implemented that into Vena scoring, uh, um, uh, Vena docking program. And when we implemented that, the, in the accuracy for halogenated contrast has immensely uh, improved. So here, if you look at this, uh, here's an animation where like, okay, so this is the ground truth, the green one. In this case, this is a crystal structure. And uh, then when you are docking this molecule, it is looking for places, but not in the actual binding pocket. Uh, whereas here with, the, with our improved, um, uh, when we incorporate the halogen bonds uh, into the scoring function, you can see this molecule can, uh, can go right in there. Uh, because in this case, it is looking at the repulsive force, uh, the, the physics-based scoring function, whereas in this case, uh, it is going in there, right there, and you can see like it's, it's, it's fitting right there. So we improved this and like now we get a lot of citations for our paper on this, um, uh, for this one. Um, um, so this is a, we call it, it's a Vina XP. So Autodoc Vina is the most widely used program and we developed this Vina XP program, which is a, which is same as Autodoc Vina, but we improved um, one function. We implemented the halogen bonding in them. So the accuracy for halogen uh, aided atoms is, is highly improved in this case. So we also used, that was physics based, but like we also used uh, uh, machine learning to, um, um, to improve uh, the scoring function. And here is uh, one of our um, uh, program, which is called DL score. Um, it's based on deep learning. So we actually were able to get much better results uh, with this as well. And uh, here uh, the, the root mean square, if you see like this is 1.15 kilocalories per mole. So that means like we have a pretty accurate um, uh, uh, algorithm that is uh, within the experimental error um, when we looked at this. Um, on, on our um, uh, test set. So here, most of the code that we develop, we are an open science enthusiast and like we actually make them available as a, whenever possible, uh, we make it available as a web-based application, but also for people who can use our uh, code and uh, validate it and also improve it, we make it available for them. Um, a, there is something called GitHub. Uh, if you're not familiar with, that's the place where most of the people will put their code for others to access it. Um, so we, we put that on, on, on GitHub. So here is another, um, um, here is another um, application that we, uh, uh, we, we just developed. Um, so if you look at uh, this, this is called, um, um, this is for uh, GPCR um, uh, proteins. So GPCR proteins, and I'm sure like all of you have heard GPCR, G protein coupled receptors. These are one of the main receptors um, that that most of the uh, drugs uh, target them because uh, these are on the, on the cell membrane and they pass the information inside the, uh, inside the cell. So G proteins, so recently, this is a new research like in the last, um, 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 in, in the last couple of years, in the last uh, six, seven years, um, uh, it is uh, discovered that G proteins have a, they, they modulate, um, uh, two different uh, things uh, downstream. So like one is the G protein and the other one is beta arrestin. So some drugs will activate both the G protein when, 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 when the drug is bound to the protein, GPCR, it can activate uh, G protein and also beta arrestin. So there are two things that it can activate. Um, so one can lead to analgesia in this case. Okay, here's an example. The other one can lead to tolerance. Uh, so in the U.S., like okay, so like okay, opiates. There's a lot of opiate use, and um, uh, you know, one is they, they start because like okay, they have a some pain, and uh, they use as a pain medication, but they get addicted, and like okay, they've been they've been using it for they, uh, they get addicted to the drugs, so it's a huge problem here. So 
but one is a good effect and the other one is a bad effect. So most GPCRs have this, like one leads to a desired effect, the other one leads to a side effect. So um, the drugs, uh, some of the drugs can selectively activate one pathway and not the other pathway. So like we want drugs to, to have a, to do rational design drugs, we want a biased drug, uh, biased drug that actually lead to uh, whatever the effect that you're looking for. In this case, you're looking for analgesia and not for this. So you can, can we just have the drugs that are biased towards one, one side. So here we developed a, uh, an application, it's called BiasNet. Uh, so people can go in, put the smile or drug name or pumpkin CID and it can predict and tell whether it's a, towards the G protein or towards a beta or, or towards a beta arrestin. So here, um, um, again, another application um, we developed here is called Redal 2020. This is for COVID research. And uh, this was recently published um, in the Nature Machine Intelligence. So uh, this is again, Drug Central. This is another uh, uh, big resource that I want to point out, like all of you pharmacy students can go in there. This is a very good resource um, uh, for a lot of drug information that is um, uh, developed by me and my, my collaborator. Uh, um, so I'm part of it, uh, the Drug Central as well. Um, so here uh, we developed this, um, um, this machine learning tool um, where you, uh, we are predicting different assays. We are predicting the effect of drug molecules towards different um, um, different SARS-CoV-2 assays. So we developed like models for 12 different uh, assays. So um, if the molecule will work towards uh, COVID or not, um, whether it will have a therapeutic effect or not. So this, um, again, like this is an output page where it shows like, okay, the given molecule um, and their properties and uh, different assays, whether it'll be active or inactive towards that. So this again is, um, so we prioritized molecules uh, based on machine learning and like, okay, uh, based on machine learning and there are also some other docking in the other experiments. And uh, so now like we have tested um, um, uh, molecules for rep repurposing and also we have tested, uh, we designed some new molecules um, and uh, we generated a lot of um, uh, preclinical trials, uh, um, uh, um, animal, animal studies, um, in vitro studies, and, and followed by animal studies. Now we are uh, moving towards clinical trials on some of these molecules for the COVID. Um, again, like when you see, like okay, the the world, it's uh, um, it. It, it revolves around. So we did a lot of research, but I, now I'm actually um, approaching uh, JSS to do some of, uh, to um, um, uh, for clinical trials. So we've been talking to um, JSS uh, leadership team again in, in some of the help uh, for uh, clinical trials um, for the COVID that we, uh, we come up with. So um, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to acknowledge like um, several people from my lab. Um, uh, that's me and here me at School of Pharmacy. So we have a lot of people. Um, so one thing I want to say is like, okay, so I wanted to um, uh, work with a lot of um, um, students from JSS. Um, so we have a lot of programs. So I'm faculty in School of Pharmacy, but I'm also associated with uh, bioinformatics, computer science and computational science and chemistry and biochemistry uh, departments. Um, so we have various PhD and master's programs. So um, any of you, if you're interested in pursuing um, um, uh, studies, uh, higher studies in, in the US, uh, and if you're interested in some of this uh, kind of work, um, uh, you're welcome to contact me uh, and I can um, um, let you know um, uh, the process and help you guys um, if, uh, if you're interested, I help you guys to uh, um, welcome to my lab. Um, so usually we, we pay a stipend of um, um, uh, 2000 to uh, 2400 in, in the range of 2000 2400 per month. Uh, that's what we do. We have uh, several open positions and uh, you guys are welcome to reach me. Um, so here I just want to show um, so here's my family. Um, so JSS, like, okay, not only just the education, but uh, actually it gave me my family. So my wife, uh, she was also a JSS alumni. Um, so here's my kid. Um, 
So, and here, like, okay, some of our, uh, JSS um, our friends, uh, we always um, get together, we try to get together sometimes every week or two, uh, sorry, not, not week or two, every, every year or, or other year. And um, so this was in Sedona, this was in California, and like there are other, uh, there are several other places and with other friends too, like we, 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 we still get together, yeah. So with that, I will uh, stop my presentation um, and I'll be very happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Suman. It was uh, uh, very well explained uh, by uh, uh, taking uh, case studies and uh, uh, it was a really wonderful presentation. And I am sure uh, uh, today our uh, participants have so many, so, many, so many questions. And also glad to see uh, that uh, your family and our JSS alumni, <laughs> which you have uh, shared. Uh, now I, uh, I request uh, participants uh, uh, and also we could see some of the uh, questions. Uh, we will take one by one. Okay. Um, so um, do you want to uh, ask me the questions, uh, Yogi, or do you just want me to read and uh, answer the questions? Uh, read uh, the question, first question. Uh, it is from Dr. Vadiraj. Uh, what is your advice for the students who wants to work in ML in drug discovery? Which skills they need to have? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, I definitely wanted to say something about that. So like, okay, so that I'm, I'm glad um, that someone asked that question. So um, so the, the, the first thing is, um, um, I want you guys to understand a little bit about machine learning. Um, so it's, it's there are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of resources out there. So first, like okay, try to. Um, so there is a um, course era um, um, that's where like okay, there are a lot of uh, good machine learning um, courses are available. Um, so one thing is like okay, there is a, a programming language called Python. Um, so that will help a lot. So that is the main language that is used for uh, machine learning. So I, you don't have to become a, a programmer. You will, you will become a scientist. You will not become a, you, you'll become a data scientist. So you need to understand the data better. You, you don't have to become a big programmer. Uh, but so as you, um, so when you get an experience, when you learn more information, then you, you have a research question, then you understand your data better. And because that is coming from your domain knowledge. So you're all in the pharmacy school. So you understand a lot of your pharmacy data. So if you understand the data, then you frame a research question. Then um, what you, the tools you need is, is, um, uh, is Python programming language. Um, so that is one thing that uh, you need to learn a little bit if you can. And there are a lot of um, resources out there. And I recommend Coursera, Coursera, C-O-U-R-E-S-E-R-A. Coursera is a great platform where you can uh, learn a lot of, um, a lot, uh, um, lot of information and uh, there are a lot of courses out there. So always just try to, I mean, the first step is, is, a big, uh, is a big step because you're going out of your comfort. But once you try a little bit new things, you will actually really you get a kick and you 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 enjoy it and you you want to do more. Um, so those are my um, uh, my suggestions. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, there is another question uh, from Vadiraj. Please elaborate on the type of descriptors used for docking uh, rescoring by ML. Yeah. Okay. So that's um, the. Um, uh, that's a very good question. I had a slide on that, but I, I, I removed it because um, it's, uh, it's getting too long. So like we used about 300 descriptors in this case for, for, for docking. Uh, I assume your question was specific for docking. So we used um, something called the binding analyzer. It's called banana uh, descriptor. So it has all the information such as atomic contacts, okay, hydrogen bonds, pi pi contacts, Okay, all those contacts. So there are a total of 300 descriptors uh, that we used and we, uh, we processed that through the deep learning uh, algorithm. Uh, so uh, it's, it's called banana features and it has 300 descriptors. Um, it consists of 
atomic information, uh, atomic contacts, um, and um, hydrogen bonds, pi pi interactions, and so on. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, there is another question. That is, sir, can you briefly tell what it means to fit the model with the data? Okay. Um, that's a good question. Um, so what do I mean by fit the data to the model? So here we are developing a, uh, we, we are developing an algorithm. Uh, and um, so when I'm saying algorithm here, we are you're developing a, an equation. Okay, you're, you're developing an equation and uh, that you're using that, basically you call that equation as a model and you use that to predict uh, predict um, for the next set of experiments. So when before you do that, so what you need to do is, um, okay, so let me go to one of my slides. So here, um, I have, if we have, when we have a set of molecules and this set of molecules have molecular descriptors. So here in this case, you see one, two, three, four, five. Um, um, you see like five molecules because five dotted lines are there. Then these are descriptors and these are responses. Um, so that means it's an activity. Um, it can be binding affinity or it can be anything, IC50 values or whatever. So you are correlating these to, to, the, to the response variable. So what it means is you're correlating. Um, so when you, when you correlate them, so you get an equation, basically you, you, get, you put the data and you get the line and this line in this case is a, is a QSAR or, or an equation. So by using this line, if you know the properties, then you can uh, predict its, um, its activity. So in simple term, you have your, it's a correlation, fitting is a correlation. So what you're doing is you're correlating yeah, your features to the activity in this case. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, by Ruthinjay sir. Uh, what do you mean by unhealthy genes? So th this is just, I was giving an example here. Uh, so there are like, okay, genes that causes, um, um, th that leads to, in, in cancer. So basically in, in, in cancer, like you have a healthy genes and you have a disease uh, uh, genes that, that, that um, genes that leads to, to diseases. Okay. Uh, Uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Shiv Kumar Ji. What are the problems associated, associated with artificial intelligence? Uh, can you repeat that? What are the What are the problems associated with artificial intelligence? Okay. So, what are the problems associated with artificial intelligence? Okay. The biggest problem is data. So, in drug discovery, the data is still sparse. Uh, we don't have a lot of data uh, for a lot of things. For example, if you look at the, in this case, if you look at the clinical trial data or like, okay, for um, uh, even like molecules and targets and like uh, different molecules, we don't have data, a lot of data. So if we have more data, we can do a lot more things uh, and we can predict things more effectively. Uh, but unfortunately, um, so most of the data that is out on the public domain is uh, developed in academia and like uh, most of the pharma, um, because of their business model, they cannot uh, reveal the data. So if we have a lot of data, we could have done much more things, but the biggest problem is the data because now we have a huge computer, supercomputers, and we have um, um, uh, very advanced algorithms, um, though the main problem is, is the data. What are the misconceptions about AI? Uh, question by Nimisha Jolie. Okay. 
uh, misconceptions about the AI um, that AI can solve uh, everything. Um, um, well, it, it can do a lot of things, but it cannot uh, um, solve everything. Um, so right now in drug discovery, we can do a lot more things, but the data is sparse. And because of that, we have some limitations um, and uh, misconceptions. And if you look at some of the ethical things and in, in, it's not drug discovery, but if you go up beyond that, uh, that can be misused. Um, uh, yeah, I can be misused in, in several ways. And um, so that needs to be looked at and uh, things, um, regulations and uh, needs to come up for that. And, and there are people um, regulating um, uh, the misuse of AI uh, as well. The governments are looking into that. Uh, the next question, uh, someone by Nasreen Banu. Is there any course on artificial intelligence? Yes, uh, there are there are there are courses, and um, as I mentioned, the um, course era. Um, I, I would uh, encourage you guys to go to course era, and there are um, 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 there are courses by. Andrew NG, okay, his name is Andrew Nig, uh, Andrew NG. Uh, so he is um, one of the best um, uh, instructor. He was, he was a professor at Stanford and he also worked at Google and also other big companies, but he has his own company right now, but he is a Stanford professor and that uh, is the very famous course. Uh, there, there, there are a line of courses, uh, deep learning, machine learning by him. And uh, those are some of the best courses. Um, so I would encourage you guys to um, look into those courses. Okay. There is another question by Shalini R. What are the softwares available to analyze differential gene expression? Um, differential gene expression. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly which ones, uh, but I'm sure like there are, there are a bunch of um, applications um, uh, are out there. Um, I cannot give a specific one at the moment. Uh, there is another question by Asha Srinivasan. Uh, has your lab performed the preclinical drug toxicity screening using uh, artificial intelligence? How accurate is the artificial intelligence screening when compared to the animal screening data? How has, uh, by the question, how has uh, AI helped decrease the uh, attrition rate in drug development? I think uh, I can just go through in the AI box. Uh, Suman, and see. Okay. Um... Like, uh, repeat again. Okay, so uh, has your lab performed preclinical data screening using AI? Um, yes, we did for the COVID. Um, so how accurate? So we, uh, so we, we have um, um, seventy percent success. I would say like roughly seventy percent success, which is which is good. Um, so, and like one of the things that we are currently working is a drug uh, combination, and this is for COVID, and we developed a model. Uh, so um, we, we tested all the approved drugs. We tested like 3,000 approved drugs in vitro, in, in, in vitro screening, and we have like a list of compounds that show activity, uh, some activity. So we are trying to find, because like we, they have some activity, and uh, you, if you use, uh, one drug, it will have only one activity, but if we use a combination and we are trying to find a synergic combination, synergistic combination that can have a better effect and also have, if you can give it a lower dose, you can have less side effects. So we are trying to do that. So we are running those experiments right now, drug combinations. Um, so that, is, so we have about, um, um, 50, 60 drugs that we are looking at. Um, and if we wanted to run the combination tests like that, that's so many combinations. 
Uh, so we're using AI in, in decreasing the number of um, combinations that we can test. So it has been helping a lot in, in, in that project in, in that respect. Okay. Then uh, the next question uh, that is, uh, can we on uh, 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 that is how uh, the uh, toxicity that is particularly genotoxicity can be predicted using AI? How the, uh, which one, uh, how the genome talk? Yeah, by Bahama. Can brief on like uh, how the genotoxicity can be predicted. Yeah, uh, you, you're talking about this one uh, from Bama. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, can you brief on using AI um, in predicting toxicity? Okay. So um, again, so toxicity, there, there are different types of toxicities. So basically you look at the data. Um, so there is, a, um, there is a famous data set. Uh, it's called ToxNet um, uh, data set from um, by, by uh, I think it was from FDA. Um, so they have a lot of molecules um, and they have toxicity. Um, so, um, so we have a toxicity model. We have a bunch of, a couple of toxicity models. It's, it's again, like you're looking at different types of toxicities. Um, so, um, and, and, and for toxicity prediction, uh, there are several models, um, again, based on the data. So, um, I mean, uh, this toxicity has been uh, really addressed and like, okay, th this has been widely used. Um, I don't know, I can talk uh, if there is more specific that you wanted to hear. Uh, uh, next uh, question from Jagdish Chan. Can you please brief in short about the legend activity predictor site? And can we determine NC50 value computationally without going for retroactivity? Okay. Um, yes, we can predict the IC50 values without going to uh, in vitro activity. Um, so, so usually you want to confirm afterwards, but we can predict. predict. So that is what something that we, we've been doing a lot and uh, my lab has been uh, uh, involved a lot in, in uh, determining the ligand activity. So one is you have a given protein uh, you wanted to see whether the given ligand is active or not. So we have machine learning models we have developed and like we, uh, th those are available as a web, uh, web based tools, but we also use uh, docking. That's another thing um, uh, to, but for docking, if you know the structure of the protein, then usually we use the docking. But if for machine learning, we are uh, machine learning based uh, methods, which are lig we call ligand based methods. So when we use ligand based method, we are not even uh, using the protein structure. Um, so, uh, so for that, um, so we have both machine learning and also docking based methods to predict the IC50 values. So uh, I, I mean, not exactly IC50, what you're getting is a binding affinity, but you can correlate that to IC50 values. You mean to say it has to be, we have to cross check uh, once we do the in mm -hmm. Then uh, Shankar ESJ, how AI and uh, machine learning can be used in the field of pharmacokinetics and clinical trials? Yeah. So uh, again, so this is uh, where uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, it's, a, it's a narrow field. So we're like, okay, only pharmacists can do. Um, so this is actually a, 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 a huge field uh, where like, okay, there are very few people and even in the US, like, okay, the, the, the people, uh, the, the, these jobs, if you look at medicinal chemistry and all that, so the people who are doing chemistry and other things can, and for, even for pharmacology, like other people can come and um, do things, but for pharmacokinetics, it's very uh, narrow and like only pharmacists can do. So it's, it's a very nice field. So here you can predict a lot of things, pharmacokinetics using AIML. So uh, we can predict different pharmacokinetic properties 
for example, if you want to predict like Cmax uh, and uh, T half of molecules and all those, so you you can you can predict um, um, those using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, algorithms, and those are important. Those are very very important, and again, in even in clinical trials. Right, so actually, so if you look at this um, slide that I've shown earlier, so if you look at this, okay, here, uh, there are different things. So here, like clinical trials. Um, so can you predict the outcome of phase one, phase two, and phase three uh, by using like the drug molecules that have failed at these levels and their molecules that are approved. So by using these, can we predict the outcome of the clinical trials? And if we can predict the outcome of the clinical trials early on, that will have a huge impact on the drug discovery process. So that's a, for clinical trials, uh, it's, it's really, um, um, it, it, uh, it will have a huge impact. Uh, next question is from Manisha Singh. Sir, does increasing the training data affect the accuracy of the model? Uh, does increasing the training data affect the accuracy of the model? Yes. So uh, the, the answer is yes. If you increase the training data, uh, most likely um, you're going to increase the accuracy of the, uh, of the model. So, and again, it depends. Um, so if you're using, if you bring new data and that is different from the existing data, that will always increase your applicability domain of the model. So usually what we call is something called applicability domain. So you develop a model, but that cannot be applied for every molecule and everything. So usually if it falls within the applicability domain, uh, then you will, your, your accuracy is usually higher. Um, so when you increase the data size, what you're doing is you're uh, increasing your applicability domain, you're, you're um, uh, uh, extending the applicability domain of the model. So that usually uh, increases your accuracy. And there is the next question. Recent developments, uh, okay, uh, probably is expecting any uh, uh, success uh, uh, stories. Yeah. Uh, recent success stories, yes. Uh, um, so actually, I was showing here uh, in the presentation, for example, okay, this one was where, like, okay, within a couple of days that the molecules were designed and tested and have an activity. Uh, and there was a another uh, MIT paper where like, okay, they showed like, okay, they find a very potent uh, um, antibiotic uh, using, uh, um, using the artificial intelligence. And here the alpha fold uh, where uh, protein structure prediction, this is a huge news that uh, uh, was the, um, happened recently uh, that the AML can do uh, much better uh, than the previously existing algorithms. And here, automating chemical synthesis, again, like these are different, uh, as shown examples of different fields that uh, have a huge impact uh, in the drug discovery process. And um, we have our molecules that I'm talking about for the COVID, like we, we, are, uh, uh, we have designed some molecules, but like for repurposing that we have um, some molecules that we are uh, trying to take into clinical trials that came out of this uh, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning as well. Uh, okay, so next question uh, it is by uh, Dr. Vishwanath. Uh, any online free uh, AI tools for predicting genotoxicity in continuation to earlier question and carcinogenesis of drug candidates? Uh, yes, uh, there are. Uh... There are different um, tools. So we are actually putting together all these AI ML tools uh, to, into a, uh, ourselves we are uh, building um, um, a, a platform where like we trying to put all these um, for um, um, drug discovery applications uh, and also um, all the biology related applications we're reporting on uh, uh, text advanced computing center portal. Um, so that we are gonna make it available pretty soon. 
Uh, but uh, the question is for uh, genotoxicity. Uh, and I'm sure like, okay, there, there are a lot of these uh, applications available out there. I can just, um, um, I, uh, I can forward that to, um, that to you. Yes. Uh, next question by Neeraj Paliwal. How far the regulatory agencies would accept uh, uh, the AI-based results for the newly approved drugs, uh, drugs, uh, and would this still be required to be assisted with preclinical and later on with the clinical studies? If yes, is the AI-based research limited to target identification or lead optimization itself? So this is a great question. Um, so, so usually everything needs to be validated. Um, so the, these are there to help the experiments. Uh, but I, I really wish like it, we will reach at some point where like okay we predict and uh, then we'll be okay with that. Um, not, not even tested, but like we are far away from that. Um, but actually, FDA, um, US FDA, United States Food and Drug Administration, that's the um, major regulatory authority which um, uh, which approved drugs in the US. Um, and um, so FDA um, is already accepting some of the computational based methods. Okay, so usually quantitative structure, quantitative systems pharmacology methods. Yeah, basically they're all, again, there's the AIML component in them too, but uh, so to something that without the experiments, okay, just with the computational part, okay, that includes the AIML, uh, uh, but also it's a system-based method. So they're, they're accepting in, in some cases, okay, that FDA has, uh, has approved based on the modeling. Okay, and when I'm saying this, like, um, um, you need to take this with a pinch of salt because it's not everything that they they just approve. Okay, in some cases, okay, they, for example, like in 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 some repurposing cases, drug repurposing, in in, in some cases, okay, they're they're accepting some um, when you just you, with just the modeling, um, not necessarily the experimental um, results. So that's a good sign. Uh, we, um, uh, for uh, computational methods and predictive models, um, AIML. Uh, but there, there, there are a lot of cases where we need to validate that with experiments. Yogesh, uh, still how many questions uh, can I have? Uh... In the clear box, it is done, sir. Uh, any other questions uh, from the panelists? Uh, Dr. Suman, uh, thank you uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, it was uh, really goes well, and uh, you uh, covered all the facets of uh, AI with respect to the discovery. I have a few uh, questions. Uh, one which you told about, uh, uh, you developed some web po portals. Yes. Are they accessed to everyone, or uh, the request uh, they are available? No, they're they're, they're accessible to everyone. Um, so I can, uh, yeah, they're, they're accessible accessible to everyone. They're they're up uh, online. Um, uh, if not all, most of them are. Um, so let me. So if you go to drug discovery. Dot YouTube dot edu. For example, this one is a is a biasnet which I. Um, showed earlier about GPCR ligand. So if you put the drug name, it will give um, so th this is one of the I've, I've shown uh, whether it's showing like whether it will be towards a uh, GPCR uh, a G protein or, or beta arrestin. Uh, another one, oh, let me show So these are there. I can um, provide the links. Um, okay. So here, like, okay, if you give a drug molecule or any uh, molecule, this will test uh, 
it will run through 800 different uh, proteins and uh, it will give whether it will have an effect towards any of the proteins. So if we, this is helpful in predicting the side effects and also activity, if you synthesize the molecule, for example, um, and um, if the molecule has a, uh, if you want to check if it have a, a effect towards other proteins. Uh, so if you just run through this one, it is showing like a, the given molecule is, um, can have activity towards all these other proteins. So these are like a uniprot ID. So if you click on that, uh, it will lead to um, that particular protein information. So yeah, these websites are all available. Um, um, so these are up um, online. Another right. question, uh, Suman, that you said uh, we can uh, uh, calculate, uh, determine uh, IC50 value from AIG tools, uh, then how the results would be with respect to the, uh, the biological activity, which uh, observed biological activity in comparison um, with respect to what percentage uh, they would results in comparable. So it, it, uh, it is again like, uh, we, we have different tools. So, okay, some of the machine learning tools, like if we have, um, we need to look at the validate, validity of the model. Um, so if they are, um, if the models, most of the models that we develop have a high accuracy, but if we are checking for the molecule that is within the applicability domain, usually we should get a very good accuracy. So most of them are in the accuracy range of 0.9 or something like this. So that means 90% accuracy. Uh, if it falls within the applicability domain of our training data. And uh, these uh, web portal can use that uh, new uh, novel molecules which we synthesized or uh, only that uh, we have yes. yeah. No, you, you can use novel molecules. We can use uh, any novel molecules that you have synthesized and see if it have any other effect. So you, we don't have to, it, it's not limited to uh, existing molecules. Okay. Another question uh, that is uh, the, for the beginners, uh, what uh, what is the requirement uh, that one can uh, uh, work with AI? Uh, so because everyone is uh, been fancy to work with uh, artificial intelligence with respect to drug design, what minimum uh, requirement one can uh, start with? So uh, there is an. There, there is no, um, I would not say like there is a minimum requirement. So like it depends upon like the people who, uh, if if people, if for, for students, like, okay, so they do not have a lot of domain knowledge. They are uh, right now, they're learning at the learning phase. So uh, it's if they work on like some of the case studies um, and, and then like for, for the, there is a little bit of programming, but like you don't, there are a lot of applications uh, that you, you can do a lot of, uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence without programming as well. There are a lot of tools and uh, I wanna uh, mention this tool, which is called Nine. Um, so Nine for data analytics. If you use this tool, uh, there are a lot of um, YouTube videos on this without any programming knowledge, you can develop some, uh, you, can, you can develop machine learning models uh, with, without any programming language. So it will take care of uh, the, 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 the programming and the backend. So this is Nime, uh, it's called Nime. And um, you can see like the, there are a lot of uh, uh, YouTube videos you have. I think this is the best place to start. And if you're interested in programming, um, Python is the language. Um, it, it, Python is a scripting language. So it is a, that means uh, it, it looks like, a, I mean, it's more human readable. Um, so when you look at it, you will understand the code easily and it's easy to learn. So a little bit of Python would help. Um, so most of the time you're dealing with the data, but if you are uh, an, uh, a, a researcher who have a domain knowledge, for example, uh, sir, if you are interested or if you wanted to apply machine learning, you already have a lot of knowledge in terms of uh, that, whatever the project you're working in that there, uh, so you have a lot of knowledge on the, on the data, which is very, very important. So you know what you are trying to do, and then you're just trying to find a tool that can uh, solve your problem. So in that case, um, so you already have a knowledge, a lot of knowledge on the data. You just need to look at the tools. Um, so uh, I would say like this NIME is a very good, um, 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 
a very good uh, tool uh, to start with. Um, so using machine learning with, with Nime, um, that, that this will uh, help a lot. And uh, the other one I was actually telling everyone was Coursera. This have a lot of... Um, So if you go to Coursera, there are a lot of um, uh, machine learning courses in there. This Coursera has a lot of courses, not just machine learning, it has everything, but um, the Coursera um, courses by Andrew and G. So, courses by this person, Andrew and G are, are really, really famous. And um, uh, actually there are a lot of courses I did with, with, uh, with this guy myself. So I highly encourage um, Coursera uh, machine learning courses by Andrew and G. Yeah, I think uh, there was a question on uh, this uh, by Nasreen uh, Banu, I think. Uh, what is the question, Yogi? Uh, yeah, she was asking about any course that are available. Uh, yes. yes, she has given the answer. On AI by Nasreena Banu. So I think she can note up it. Uh, that's what I just wanted to convey. So if uh, no other questions, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Saman, that uh, you elaborated uh, things, you have answered many questions uh, raised by the participants. We are really uh, happy with that, uh, the answer given by you, that uh, hope was a, when participant also satisfied the answers. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Prashant. So if you have anything to say apart from that, uh, Saman, uh, Oh, again, I just wanted to thank the opportunity. I'm very glad to be here and uh, speaking to um, you all and the students. Um, so I'm uh, very glad to be part of JSS family. Uh, so um, it's um, uh, it has been a great journey for me um, going through JSS and um, uh, to be where I am right now yet. Um, so. Uh, this is, um, yeah, so I'm very happy to be talking to the students uh, right now. Now you can proceed, uh, Yogesh, then uh, Prashant will give the word of thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Someone, it was a really wonderful uh, time we spent, and uh, it was a very overwhelming presentation by you. I'm sure our uh, participants and also our students. Uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, uh, enrich their knowledge uh, with your presentation. And uh, uh, yes, I think, I think before moving, we shall we have one uh, snapshot? I think uh, Kamal sir, Kamal sir, I have... Kamal sir is there? Uh, yeah, I just share the. No, I have taken. Uh... Okay. Okay, sir. If it's taken, it is fine. Yeah. I have taken. Uh, fine then. Uh, so I request uh, uh, Prashant sir uh, to uh, give word of thanks. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, with the blessings of uh, His Holiness, uh, Dr. Sri. Jagat Guru Sri Deshikendra Mahaswamiji of Supermant, I stand be I am before you all to propose a word of thanks for this uh, webinar. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suman Sirimullah, an assistant professor of medicinal chemistry, uh, School of Pharmacy, University of uh, Texas, uh, uh, EL, uh, so United States of America for his uh, valuable time, of, uh, despite his uh, busy schedule, being an alumnus of this institution and uh, sparing his valuable time. Actually, because a uh, lot of the participants, including me, we had a lot of uh, uh, doubts uh, in the sense like, how to, uh, uh, what is this artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, uh, how it can be used in the real-time practice like that. 
So with your presentation, we understood that what exactly this uh, artificial intelligence is all about and uh, where it can be applied, uh, taking into our uh, uh, case studies, uh, whatever we are doing it, uh, where exactly we can implement these uh, artificial intelligence uh, like that. So on behalf of the management principal, all the staff members and uh, all the participants who are gathered here, I wholeheartedly thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time. And uh, next, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our patrons of this uh, webinar, uh, our Pro Chancellor, Dr. B. Suresh, and uh, Dr. Surinder Singh, sir, Vice Chancellor of uh, GSS Academy of Higher Education Research. They are the guiding lights uh, for us to uh, conduct such kind of these kind of programs. And uh, next, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. T.M. Pramod Kumar, sir, is the principal of our institution. He's actually the real motivation because of which uh, we could able to connect, uh, conduct these series of uh, webinars like that. And uh, next, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. G. Pujar, who is a convener of this uh, program. And uh, he has meticulously planned in the background and uh, uh, arranged, planned everything. So I would utterly thank uh, Dr. G. V. Pujar for that. And next, uh, the Dr. Yogesh Kumar is the organizing secretary uh, who uh, thought uh, initially, like, uh, why can't we conduct uh, this kind of uh, programs using Dr. Sirmula? Uh, okay. So, in that context, uh, he could be able to implement that successfully, practically today, it has been done. So, I want to thank uh, Dr. Yogesh Kumar for that being an organizing secretary of this uh, webinar. And next, uh, but to be successful, this uh, telecast this uh, on this platform, in this uh, Zoom platform, successfully it has been telecasted uh, everywhere without any issues. So I thank uh, our ID team by Dr. Ravindra, uh, CIO and his team uh, for this. And uh, uh, I thank all the participants uh, for joining this platform at this point and making this uh, successful. And remember, my dearest uh, participants, we are conducting another webinar on lead optimization of drug candidates using multi, uh, multi parameter approach. Uh, the resource person is uh, Dr. Girinath Pillai. He is also a very, resource, uh, very renowned resource person. He is from Just Innovations uh, Bangalore. He is going to talk uh, on 19th of June. Uh, between 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll share the approaches uh, uh, soon to you all. Um, please participate in that uh, webinar also and enrich your knowledge uh, in this direction like that. So I uh, thank uh, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, I saw like okay, uh, some students asked uh, contact details. I shared my email ID and also my lab website uh, in the chat. So if you need to contact me, feel free to do so. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Suman. And uh, we'll be touch with you that you know, we also working on uh, uh, the tuberculosis uh, drug development. Uh, we have a few project on that from ICMR and DBT. We have worked. In that regard, I may contact you that uh, in future. And even our uh, faculty member also working on various uh, disease models. Uh, hope uh, this uh, interaction would uh, further uh, uh, collaboration with you and uh, your uh, university. Okay. Uh, another thing is uh, Dr. Suman Sinemla is doing uh, contributing to the world of uh, science in all fraternities. Uh, being part of these portals, which is useful for everyone across the world. So it is a great, great contribution from Dr. Suman Sirumullah being part of that team and uh, doing this, uh, developing these portals for predicting drug metabolism and all these things, uh, side effects and all these things. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, Suman, it was a wonderful time. We spent, uh, as Prashant sir said, uh, really we are glad about your achievements. Uh, hope uh, this will continue and we will come up with uh, some success story uh, near the coming future. Uh, anything else, sir? Thank you. Then fine. Uh, wish you all the very best for his uh, 
anti covid uh, research work hope uh, things will be fruitful thank you very much uh, dr suman uh, and thank if you. we ask pooja sir said the suman uh, surely we will have a good collaboration uh, in future and also i have discussed with you so let us uh, hope uh, we will have a good collaboration in the future yeah yeah certainly yeah so i'm looking forward for that interaction and collaboration happy to work with jss and like with all of you so definitely feel free to reach out to me and um, yeah i'll be happy to work with uh, um, with you all sure, sure thank you once again okay thank you so much and the meeting huh? uh, okay bye okay thank you bye everyone yeah. bye, bye everyone good night to us Uh, Ravindra sir, sir Hedi, uh, thank you sir uh, for your kind cooperation uh, throughout webinar and uh, we were uh, really glad that uh, no issues. Uh, yes, yes, and it, it went very well, sir. I think it's excellent, really. Congratulations you. to you and the entire team. Uh, thank you very much. Sir. And the speakers are also they are very good, excellent. Yes, sir. sir. Yes, he was alumni, sir, alumni of our college. Yeah. He is very kind enough to do that. Yeah, congratulations, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very nice of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Pooja, sir. Yogesh. Fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pooja, sir. Uh, I think Pooja, sir. Thank you, Prashant, sir, and Dharayanand, sir, and all.